Hi kids, welcome to On The Marquee Deep Dive. This is a film podcast where we dive deep into a film. Once we are submerged within the film, we use that as an opportunity uh, to mine for some gold within the film, uh, ripe for conversation. Uh, the general concept behind this podcast is that the films that uh, get held up as the uh, the top of their genre, the best, the greatest of all time, do so not just because of the outstanding technical craft and artistry, but because there's something within the film that speaks to audiences and continues to speak to audiences. Um, so typically, we like to examine films that are 25 years or older. We can take a snapshot, see how they were received then, how they're received now, discuss the history. Breaking from that for today, uh, we're talking about a new film. It's been out about four weeks. It is Killers of the Flower Moon. It is Martin Scorsese's new film. Um, there are some topics present within the film that are unfortunately very timely and maybe there's not a lot of other films that give an opportunity to discuss some of these aspects. Also, it's just an opportunity to discuss Martin Scorsese's filmography, potentially coming close to an end. Uh, so I have the panel here to help me discuss. Uh, first up, let's introduce Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hello. Um, so, the film comes out on a Friday, and you saw it the following Tuesday? Yes, I believe so, I think. So, I either saw it on the Tuesday, or I saw it on the Thursday before it came out. I can't remember. You can't remember? <laughs> All right, that's fair. It's been about a month. Um, so, but what was it about Killers of the Flower Moon that made you go to the theater to see it? Was it Scorsese? Scorsese, it? it's one, I think, you know, I, I didn't really read up on it. I don't watch trailers anymore. I don't, I'm just, I'm there to see these movies in the moment. But, you know, for something like a three and a half hour, you know, film, you really want to see that on a big screen. Like, yeah. as much as it'd be nice to sit on the couch and pause it whenever you want, I feel like there's some intent behind the length and, you yes. know, sitting there with people all watching the same movie it, it lends to it i think yeah it's a different experience i think then that's one thing about the because it's an apple right came in and helped produce it so i'm i'm sure that the part of the reason they're going through that we discussed this a little bit not just to add to their library to attract a viewership that maybe they're missing with scorsese but also then there's probably a lot of people who haven't seen it in the theater because, oh, I can just watch it in parts on Apple TV. Right. Or in 18 parts on TikTok yeah. with <laughs> Subway Surfers <laughs> gameplay underneath. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the world, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and then Michael, uh, hello, Michael Cast. Hey. You and I saw the film together. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I thought you were going to say we will drill down. Oh, drill down was yes. better. Yeah. I should have uh, round tabled the <laughs> pitch here, go. introduction. Uh, so I asked you if you wanted to go because in the past we've discussed Scorsese. We yeah. discussed yeah. his film before this, The Irishman. I feel like you're more likely to go see a Scorsese film than maybe any other current director? I don't know. I don't, about, know. I don't, I don't know. For me, I don't think the director has a lot to do with it. No? I mean, I would go see Napoleon, and I don't know anything about Ridley Scott. Mm -hmm. You know, I, th I just want to see Napoleon to see how how accurate it is historically. <laughs> <laughs> right? there, you know? Yeah, I don't know if you... If you saw because how in online you are but there was uh somebody uh pointing out uh some aspects of the trailer already that oh. are not historically accurate and and uh yeah i don't think he bombarded the, could the, care less. i don't think he i don't think he bombarded the 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 pyramids at giza no, yeah i think i don't know yeah maybe 
Scott's yeah. pretty notorious, I think, for like quickly churning these things out. Oh, so then maybe I won't go. Probably he doesn't uh, <laughs> meticulously go over the uh, the. T- Actually, so the trailer plays before the movie. Mm-hmm. I went and saw it again last night. Second time upon watching the trailer, because it was only the second time I've seen the trailers, because like you, Andrew, I try to avoid trailers. I can't, I was thinking about the historical inaccuracies and stuff, and I realized that I think, who knows, we haven't seen the film yet, that this is probably Ridley Scott's attempt at addressing uh, that orange-haired being. Oh. Just the vibe I was getting from the whole... Joaquin Phoenix's Napoleon. Hmm. I don't know if that's true, but that's just the thought that entered my mind watching Well, that I would trailer. go watch it just for that, just to see if it is. Yeah. Who knows? Just out of curiosity. So, yeah. Scorsese, the other reason I thought that he might be someone that you would be interested in watching, besides our conversations, is he's a guy who's also directed a lot of concert films, uses the Rolling Stones music quite a lot. Mm-hmm. You're a big Stones fan. Does that help lend to you sort of uh, your interest in Scorsese? Is that You know, maybe he's got, subconsciously, maybe. I never thought of it, you know? I mean, I, I think he's, I, for his age, he's, he's pretty contemporary and he tells good stories like he tells good stories um i've noticed that most of the film most of my favorite films are are coppola films but i never realized it until i looked at them all right right? and uh but uh, i realized that i like most almost all of scorsese's films that i've seen so it could be something to do with his ability to tell stories and i think he like i said i think he's for his age, he's pretty, he's, I don't think he's afraid of technology. I mean, you see that in The Irishman, yep. right, with the aging stuff. But uh, I think he just, he just tells a good story. He just tells a good story. And stories that, that you, you know, for me, I would be like, like for this one, Killers of the Flower Moon, it's like, why did he choose that story? Then when we got into it, I'm like, oh yeah, that's his sort of modus operandi, the characters, and we talked about this when we were coming up here, <clears throat> that's sort of the characters that he chooses and the theme of greed and, and corruption. Yeah, he's always, we, yeah, we discussed a little bit that there's always, even something like this, when it's a true story, there's definitely... A Scorsese aspect to it. It's it's crazy that so watching it the second time last night, paying attention. So I watched it the first time, then I went and read the book, and then I watched it a second time. So the second time, I'm That's more dedication. I'm man. more thinking about uh, the actual events, the book, um, how things are presented, because I know it's a movie. You change things around. What do you add? What do you subtract? Even if it's a three and a half hour movie, things have to go and get cut. But it just the the way that it plays out without really playing around with the timeline a lot, still like a Scorsese gangster film. It still kind of fits his patterns, and it's. Well, King Hale was a piece of work, man. Holy shit! Like, and and I think too, like those characters, those those villainous type characters, nefar. I like the word nefarious characters. Uh, I think they. Um, oh shoot! What was he gonna say? Um, they're manipulative, right? Like. Um, I, I forgot what I was going to say, so carry on. Okay. I, it may come, I may remember later. I may not. So, Andrew, mm-hmm. how... Because I know in the past we've discussed um, The Wolf of Wall Street. Yep. But how familiar are you with Scorsese films? Have you seen a lot? Not, I haven't seen very many, no. I mean, I <laughs> saw The Irishman and, yeah, Wolf of Wall Street. And then this one, I don't think any others. No? No. You, so, like, the earlier Mean Streets, no, Raging Bull? not really on my radar. No? no? Taxi Driver? No, Taxi Driver's on my list, though. I've got okay. a big list of movies to watch. It's on there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> when it came out, it was like, ooh, we got to go see Taxi Driver. 
oh, we got to go see Taxi Driver. There's this thing in there, blah, 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 right? <laughs> so back when our, our going to see an R-rated movie was like, ooh, a big deal, right? Mm-hmm. You know, as a teenager. Taxi Driver, Andrew, uh, kind of is a companion almost in some ways to our um, All the President's Men conversation mm. because it's, um, is it Arthur Bremer, Brenner? Is that his name? Arthur Bremen? The the assassin who um uh yeah, who tried to shoot the governor. Now I Oh I I can't I can't remember uh, that. Anyways, yeah. he's uh dis- he's mentioned in all the president's men. Gotcha. He had diaries. His diaries are part of the basis for the main character Travis Bickle in Taxi Driver. And then it's just crazy because then that's the inspiration for, is it John Hinckley? Who, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, he John, was obsessed with... with uh, John Hinckley sees the film, is obsessed with... Um, Jodie Foster. And tries to become an assassin himself to impress Jodie Foster. So hmm. it's this interesting Cycle. cycle. Yeah. The only other one, I think... He did the last waltz, right? That was yeah. A yeah, that's yeah. a Scorsese. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've seen that as well. That's actually it was funny. I think one of the uh, few good recommendations I got from a Starbucks customer <laughs> <laughs> back right. in the day. <laughs> yeah, with the band, and then from there is sort of his partnership with Robbie Robertson. Right. Who did he do? Did he, he did the did? score for Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, which I I really like mm-hmm. the score. Mm-hmm. But he he. Um, from that point on, he pretty much works with Scorsese on the soundtrack, but he's not always credited as composer because a lot of Scorsese's films are um, the thing that Tarantino kind of grabs from him is the the modern music that he puts in his soundtrack instead of a composed score. It's just the Rolling Stones, Jumpin' Jack Flash, or... Most of the films have Give Me Shelter in them. <laughs> There's a, I, doing research, there was a, a video I saw of uh, Scorsese talking about um, Mick Jagger making the joke because he directed their concert film, Shine a Light. And Jagger made the joke that, yeah, this is the only uh, Scorsese film that he never put Give, uh, Give Me Shelter, Give me shelter in. in. <laughs> did, did Scorsese direct Once Were Brothers? No. No, I think no, he's okay. a producer on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, anyways, let's uh let's dive into uh the source material here a little bit. So uh the film is based on uh David Grand's I think 2017 nonfiction book, Count of the Events. Uh David Grand, um again, kind of something similar that Neil discussed in the All the President's Men discussion when we were talking about journalists. David Grant is a journalist. Um, He was talking to someone about uh, the FBI and their surveillance of uh, left-wing political movements in the 60s and 70s. Um, And um, the person just happened to mention uh, the Osage Reign of Terror, and David Gran had no idea what he was talking about. So just for David Gran's own sort of um, knowledge, he decided that he would go out and he would um, go to Fairfax. I think there's a museum there, and he would try to research the events. And then from there on, as he gets pulled further and further into the 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 massacre, the, I don't know. It, but uh, yeah, so anyways, Grand goes and he said uh, that there was this uh, photograph and it was all the Osage uh, with the white settlers sometime in the 1920s. And there was a section of the photograph uh, that had been removed. And uh, he inquired about why that section was removed And the woman at the museum told him, oh, that uh, the devil was standing there. So she brings out a picture unaltered with the panel that had been removed. And there we have David Hale standing there. And 
David Grant was trying to kind of struck at how um, innocuous that, you know, David Hale kind of just looks like a... Um, um, your uncle. Your, your uncle grandpa. or, yeah, yeah. or yeah. like um, I was thinking like um, uh, someone who would do your taxes or mm. something like that, you know, a banker or just not the devil. So the, the novel, um, it's split up into sections. Uh, the first, I'd say 40% of this section uh, of the novel is... Um, giving the background on the Osage, how they end up in Oklahoma, how they end up with um, the head rights, the mineral rights, and then it goes into um, the murders, the string of events, and then slowly builds to uh, this investigation, things getting tied together. And then the next 40% of the novel is uh, Tom White coming in, and it starts with history of the Bureau, because it's not quite the FBI, and Tom White's history, his father also being a lawman, and his brothers as well. And then it goes into the investigation and the trials, and then it goes into the aftermath, uh, mostly following Tom White and his life and career afterwards. And then the last 20% is, um, is David Gran himself talking about uh, his experience researching this, the things that didn't quite fit into the narrative, um, the facts that even after the Bureau closes the investigation, it's, you know, they, in the film they mentioned too, there's 27, 26 odd murders, but the investigation that we connect David Hale to, or William Hale, sorry, is only a couple of those, right? There's still a lot of unsolved murders. And he, uh, he talks about going through, uh, he was just trying to look up if a certain individual had a certain guardian, and he was looking at the records of the guardians. And he noticed that, oh, this, this person um, is the guardian of, of 12 Osage, and and six of them died. Mm. And then this next one had six and all of them died and he just was struck. And mm. so David Grant says that the, the actual numbers could be in the hundreds, but the Bureau just came into, uh, he goes into it in the book as well, that it was just for sort of... Um, uh, Hoover's uh, bureaucratic moves to to build the bureau to the FBI that it would become, and so um, yeah. So when the film was initially announced, um, it was supposed to be more about the forty percent about the FBI. DiCaprio was announced to be playing Tom White. And that was going to be the basis of the film. Um, but then uh, Scorsese meeting with the Osage, talking to them, and them, you know, being up front with him and saying, we don't want this to be a white savior movie. And Scorsese admittedly saying it wasn't quite what he was going for, but it was definitely in white savior territory. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then we had the, the lockdowns and COVID and everything. So they were able to, to change directions, to restructure the film. Um, DiCaprio suggests that he should play Ernest Burkhart instead. They're trying to find the heart of the story. So they, they reframe it around Ernest and Molly. And... Um, yeah, so we get the film that we we eventually get. Uh, Scorsese uh, says that the, um, coming out of Wolf of Wall Street, his next project he had lined up was Silence, and then looking at his next project, he had two. He had uh, The Irishman and Killers of the Flower Moon. Initially, they were going to do Flower Moon first, mm. and then The Irishman, but then... Um, 
he realized that he had a bunch of seven-year-olds, and if they put <laughs> off making the Irishman every any longer, it, it might Wouldn't get work. a little bit more yeah. difficult. Yeah. yeah, more difficult to make them look young, or they just might not be around. Yeah, I mean, there's parts of the film too. Um, some of the behind-the-scenes stuff they talk about. Uh, there's a scene with Pacino as, as Hoffa getting out of the chair. And there's somebody saying, he's supposed to be 46 in this scene. <laughs> Al, you got to get up faster. faster. And then there's the, the part two I remember where um, De Niro is, is like beating that guy outside mm. the store on the curb. And it's, you can kind of tell that's, that's a seven-year-old guy man doing that. Yeah, yeah. attempting yeah. to kick somebody. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah um, so... I think we both said, Michael, after this film, uh, and I'm guessing it's the same for you, Andrew, that no idea of No, this was that, that was actually thing. immediately yeah. what I said after watching it. It was like, how do we not know about this? Mm -hmm. Like, how is it that it takes a big budget movie to tell us this stuff? Like... Yeah. American history... <clears throat> <clears throat> going to school, I went to school in the States, so from like mm. kindergarten to grade eight. <clears throat> and American history is is so, so incorrect in the schools, what they're teaching. Revisionist. It, it's, kind yeah, of. it's revisionist. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and of course, it's always the, you know, history is written by the victors, right? But <clears throat> it is, I can't, you know, I, when, I, when I came up to Canada to live with my dad, I was like, it was like, all of that history was mostly a lie, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I don't, I'm not surprised, but I'm the same way, you know? I mean, I just heard about Juneteenth. Right, mm. right. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, during the Black Lives Matter yep. and the F George Floyd, and and then and then how, I'm like, yeah, just like you. How yeah. did how the, yeah. yeah? How did I not know? How yeah. how did how were we not told about these these and you know these are cataclysmic events, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's crazy too. Like, yeah. The other thing, the Tulsa. Yeah. But uh, it's funny that, or it's not funny that they call it the Tulsa race riots when it's it's a Tulsa massacre. It was a massacre. Yeah, yeah. call it. Yeah, let's call but, it what it yeah, was. Yeah, it's, it's it's yeah something that until I think until HBO's Watchmen series, mm. another case of a piece of entertainment bringing to light something that I had no idea about, and probably a lot of people. But watching the film. When Hale is watching that newsreel about Tulsa, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's around the same time. But it wasn't until after when I went home that I realized, oh, yeah, Tulsa is also in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Yeah. And I looked it up, and because we're in Canada, uh, the, I'm going to relate it in our Canadian way, that it's about an hour's drive from Fairfax to Tulsa. Oh, that I didn't wow. know. Yeah, so yeah. they're that close <clears throat> together. And I um, uh, wrote down... So, yeah, the Tulsa Massacre was May 31st, 1921. Uh, the discovery of uh, Anna's body. That's um, Molly, Molly's sister, right? Yeah, Molly's okay. sister. Um, oh, are we going to give any spoiler alerts? Yeah, sorry. Yes. <laughs> spoiler <laughs> alerts, spoiler alert. alerts oh. to anybody and possibly... Yeah. Uh, trigger warnings and yeah. and yeah. what have you. Um, yeah. When is it? Uh, it is in May as well. I thought I had it written down on the same page here, but apparently not. May of nine of twenty one. Of yeah. So yeah, yeah um, Tulsa was May thirty first, nineteen twenty one, and uh, Anna. Body. I've got a lot of notes here, but Anna's body, I believe, was like the twenty seventh, twenty sixth, when they find her body, and she'd been missing five or six days. Mm -hmm. And then there is the uh, the other individual, uh, Charles. Oh, is this, what is his name? I'm sorry, I can't remember. Um, 
is it George Bigheart? No. That's an, unfortunately another victim. But uh, he had gone, they show him in the film around the same time, but he had gone missing, I think, a week or so before Anna. And they don't quite relate it in the film, but his body was found the same day as Anna. So the two bodies were found the same day, and it's you know four or five days before the Tulsa massacre. So this is all happening in a really short, condensed time period. Uh, yeah, I think oh, we'd forget, like Oklahoma, like 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 yeah, the dis- Oklahoma is small compared to British Columbia, right? Like like. Yeah. It's maybe the size of the island. Yeah, that's tiny yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I have it written right below. Anna Brown <laughs> and Charles Whitehorn bodies were discovered May 27th, 1921. <laughs> and, yeah, so... Yeah, I don't know what you even say about that, but um, talking about the revisionist history and everything there's um there's some um uncertainty about whether this book will be banned in Oklahoma um it's sort of being discussed now of coming before those who ban books in Oklahoma um which I think helps, well, not helps, but this sort of speaks to the importance of the film. Um, but yeah, I wrote down some of the other books that are currently banned in Oklahoma. Uh, there's I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. There's Narrative of Life of Frederick Douglass by Frederick Douglass. A Raisin in the Sun by Lorraine Hainsbury. To Kill a Mockingbird, Harper Lee. I knew Lee, that was. <laughs> and The Hiding Place, Curie Ten Boom, which is, um, which is about the Holocaust. So, yeah. <clears throat> there's, yes, there's things that apparently... Oh my God, we dare not look yes, that Oklahoma way. Yes, Oklahoma doesn't want to discuss, so they pretend they did not exist, which does not help history not repeat itself. Repeat itself, yeah. It doesn't bode well for future generations. No. Definitely not. Um, yeah, and there's been some... Uh, I've seen some criticism that I would say is is valid criticism, caring criticism about the film that raises some points. I don't know if... I'm guessing you've seen... Andrew, the video of the uh, the Osage uh, language, um, what is it? Not coordinator, but uh, oh yes, yes. yeah, the uh, consultant, consultant, maybe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the language consultant that worked with De Niro and DiCaprio and mm-hmm. Gladstone and everybody to get the Osage language done properly. And yeah, in that video, he kind of discusses. Uh, his criticism of the film um, that his main aspect that he bumps up against is uh, is portraying the relationship between Ernest and Molly as a love story. He says that's not love. You don't love or murder the. You don't family kill somebody's someone. sister. No. Yeah. Right. Or, or, no, no, he was he involved in that? I can't remember. Oh, yeah. he, uh, oh spoiler yeah. alert. <laughs> yeah, spoiler. Right? I mean, he was definitely involved in, in one of the family murders. In, in, uh, um, I can't remember. Uh, yeah. I should have gone and watched it again. The others, the, the final sister, not Anna. Um, anyways, yeah, he was definitely Maggie. Maggie's, is that her name? Was Maggie the mother? No, no. Lizzie is the mother. Um, anyways, uh, and another one of his criticisms is, is just sort of basic fact that it would take an Osage to truly tell the Osage point of view of the events, which I think is true, but I don't think that's quite what Scorsese is trying to do. I think he's, uh, to me, he's shining a light on, on, on the- on just the 
the evil that is Will William Hale and is King Hale, and and his ability to manipulate, you know, good people into doing into doing really really bad stuff. <clears throat> yeah, with I think that story, <clears throat> with that story, I don't know if. Yeah, I don't think he was trying to tell it from the Osage, or anybody's really. Like he didn't do it from the maybe from from uh, Ernest, uh, uh, Ernest, er, Ernest, Ernest is DiCaprio. Yeah, yeah, Ernest. That was seems to me it was Ernest's story. I don't know. Yeah, what are your thoughts, Andrew? Because to me, yeah, because Scorsese has said that uh, in interviews, he says what we have to face is we are the killers. We are complicit in this. We being the we of this table here that we have to acknowledge is that we're three white guys. But he, uh, yeah, I think that's what he's saying is this this whole, uh, the system the ability by a lot of the community to sort of not do anything. There's the scene after, and it's Rita. It's Rita's house that explodes. After, uh, when Hale shows up afterwards to the wreck, and there's the the one character that I think in the film is supposed to be um, Molly's guardian, and he's also in the parade, I believe wearing the KKK garments, um, but he tells William Hale something along the lines that you're you're announcing yourself too much. So there's people aware of what is going on, but because they benefit from it, well, sure, they mm. they'll just allow it to happen. Money, greed. Mm-hmm. Money. Yes, yeah. it's it's money and it's greed and it's it's that. Um, the thing that the the gravedigger says in the film when they're talking about the funeral costs and he's charging them something like eight thousand dollars and he says the the other family the the white family there's their whole funeral is only 300 dicaprio and and the guy says well it's not your money it's not your money and he kind of justifies the the price gouging as they didn't earn it. He says, you reap what you sow. Mm. And so that's <clears throat> sort of, I think, again, sort of the, the attitude behind it is, look at these people. They didn't do anything to deserve this. We're working hard. Why shouldn't we have it? I remember there was a line in the, in the movie where they were, they were uh, discussing buying the, the the nice car mm. like there were some nice <laughs> cars out there yeah. well it's it's it speaks that it, it 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 says that they were actually probably the richest people in in the world yeah, the, per in capita. the world not north america yeah. not not just the us but the world and it's like oh just come by and you can buy another one yes yeah, yeah buy yes, another. Just, yeah, yeah, another. yeah. yes next and, time you're in town yeah and these are like Duesenbergs, or these are really nice cars that you wouldn't that you would see in manhattan in the 1920s right yeah just come by and buy another one yeah a lot of the um the sort of uh, information relayed in the film uh, telling you about the situation is directly from David Grand's novel. So there's, um, there's some of that stuff in the beginning, sort of like a newsreel sort of montage telling us about the Osage. And yeah, Grand says that, yeah, they were the, the richest people per capita and that... Um, some of them would have as many as eight cars and stuff, but he also makes a point uh, in the book saying that they're no different than anybody else that would have had that wealth. There were some of them that spent it all on lavish mm-hmm. things. There were some of them who saved it. There were some of them who invested it. There were some of them that gave it away. They were no different than anyone else that would have that money right but the what struck me yeah they they could they could if their guardian yes said that they could spend it on so 
I need to go to the dentist. Oh, you need money to go to the dentist. Well, but the, but they give them money to go buy a car from a white guy. Yeah. Right. But if you wanted to go to the dentist, oh, I don't know. You know. Yeah, yeah. There's the the scene that the first time I didn't get where we we first see Molly and she's talking to the guardian and he's talking about her mom spending that much money on meat. Mm-hmm. And the first time I watched it, I thought why is she buying a lot of meat? And I thought, well, there must be some reason explained later on that what she's doing with the meat, she's giving it to... And then I realized she doesn't say the quantity of meat that she's <laughs> buying. It's how much she's spending. spending on meat. And it's like, oh, she's probably just getting gouged on the price. And Molly's sitting there, and Molly knows this, but what's she going to do, right? Yeah, like what she can can't, you say? Yeah, you can't say anything, and you can kind of see it on her that she's just kind of going with it she's right? going with it yeah. and it's not until really she walks out the door and kind of like walks mm-hmm. away that you you get that but yeah so yeah gran talks about that in the novel too the just the the price gouging that they would gouge the osage and part of it is that the osage just traditionally didn't have sort of uh attachment to things or belongings and they had made this deal because they were one of the last um, tribes to sign any sort of land agreement or treaty or anything. And they had saw what happened with other tribes. And they had already been relocated to Kansas. Twice, right? Yeah. And They've been relocated kicked, twice. Yeah. And then kicked out of Kansas. Yeah. yeah. So this was a continuing thing for them. Yeah. So by the time it gets to this... They've they've read up. They've got lawyers. They're they're intent on what they're going to do, and they yeah they sold their land in Kansas. I think they managed to because they bought it from another tribe. They were able to sell that land. I think he says for like a dollar seventy five an acre. And part of the reason they left Kansas was because the settlers were coming in and driving them out. Mm, mm-hmm. So they went to Oklahoma because, as they say in the beginning of the film, a white man won't follow us here. There's hills, there's rocks, there's there's nothing that they want here. So they go to Oklahoma. And I, th- I think Grant says in the book, just to give you an idea of the value of the land, right, they, they buy it for 90 cents an acre. So... Oklahoma Territory is worth a lot less. And then they just happen to... Until. Until, yeah. (laughs) And by the time they sign the agreement giving them mineral rights, they had found some oil on the land, but it was nothing like what they would eventually find. I think he says in, like, uh, some point in the 20s that it was, like, um, something around the... $8 Eight million dollars a year that they got, and that's amongst the two thousand something odd members that have to be divided against. But still, that's it's huge. It's huge, mm-hmm. especially ish in the twenties. Yeah, yeah. yeah, some of those wells are still they're still pumping out oil. So, uh, yeah, hundred years later, mm, right? a yeah. lot yeah. of just modern. Um, industry and stuff is based off of that like I was doing my research found out that uh, because in the book it mentions that um, so the process was the Osage would lease out the land and then they would get I think in the film it says like 10% of whatever from the oil out but they would lease out the land and they have these auctions and every time they had an auction, because of the oil, the value of, that they would get from the land would just go up and up and up. But uh, um, the Getty family is founded by leasing out Osage land and getting the oil. And then we get to John Paul Getty and all and the mobile, money in right? the world. That's mobile? Mobile? Ga- mobile? Or yeah, Esso, I think so. Or Exxon? No. I think it's mobile. I think they were mobile, yeah. Yeah, there was yeah. uh there's another one, um, Henry Sinclair. Uh so Henry Sinclair in nineteen ten with a group of investors, uh, he buys a struggling bank 
in Tulsa, would uh, become the Bank of, of uh, Oklahoma, and then using the bank and the funds, then he's able to buy, I think, like seven different smaller oil companies in Oklahoma, combine them into one, uh, and that becomes Sinclair Oil, which is still an oil company. And then uh, in uh, May 4th, 1924, uh, he got into what is now viewed a little bit of trouble, is he signed a deal with drilling rights uh, with Benito Mussolini <laughs> to drill oil in Italy. Um, and then he's involved with um, the Teapot Dome scandal. Oh. Which is, Andrew, the biggest scandal in American history until Watergate. Oh. Watergate, yeah. <laughs> All the president then. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, and then there, there's a lot of guys too in the involved in the Teapot Dome scandal that built their wealth from Oklahoma oil. Um, uh, one of them is Edward Do uh, uh, Doheny. Doheny? Uh, he was uh, also involved in the Teapot Dome scandal. Uh, he is the bassist for the character J. Arnold Ross in Upton Sinclair's novel, Oil, um, which gets turned into a movie called There Will Be Blood. Ah. Um, so he's the bassist for Daniel Plainview. Okay. And um, he had a mansion, a Greystone Mansion, that eventually, um, I believe in California, that the state buys and they lease out to uh, film productions. So it's been in a lot of films. It's uh, actually the bowling alley in There Will Be Blood mm -hmm. is in Greystone Mansion. But it's also featured, uh, Michael, in films uh, like the big Lebowski, that is Lebowski's mansion, is Grace. Oh, mansion. is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I almost. I thought for, there's two <laughs> things. I, was, I almost watched it again because I really like it, and uh, I can identify with the character <laughs> a great deal. And then, secondly, I thought we should do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we should do Lebowski. Lebowski, maybe in the new year. It's up to you. It's yeah, your, it's your deal. I, I've got. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll get we'll discuss that because I've got uh, uh, some things mapped out. Um. Yeah, so there's there's some aspects of the film that I want to highlight that are a little bit of the film taking liberties. The biggest one is our introduction to Ernest, right? Because that is our introduction to this world, right? We, Ernest gets off the train, and of course it's this big tracking shot, the Scorsese <laughs> tracking shot through, and he's, it's him seeing the world, and this is us seeing the world through him, and that's how we go through the film. But, um, uh, Ernest in real life arrived in Oklahoma in 1912. So he was not returning oh, from the war okay. Okay. to go All live right. with his yeah. uncle. I want, can I get back to the track? Was that one take? Was that one whole? I'm curious I don't, from a technical standpoint. I don't know, standpoint. actually. I was going to pay attention to that when I rewatched it last night, but yeah. I got caught up in the... Because I noticed it the first time, but I still, even the second time, there's the the group of men that are like beating on that one guy, right? Yeah, and he yeah, jumps yeah. in there and he's yeah. joining mm -hmm. along with them, yeah. and yeah. he's like laughing, just for a little, and he's just for a little. Yeah. 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 But I I didn't quite get what that was, you know? Like, if no, it, I, you I, ever I, see why there's a group of men. Attacking fighting. another, yeah, yeah fighting. Yeah. I did notice though that yeah, it's showing us different things. There's a one of the mining companies, and there's the back of the truck, and there's all the guys going yeah, to yeah, work yeah. there and stuff. And then I didn't even realize too that we meet um, uh, what is his name? There's too many names. Uh, Henry Roan, right? Henry. He meets Henry Roan. Henry Roan is the one who drives him to Hale's house. Mm -hmm. And he's and he's that's where we see the oil fields and everything. And he asks Henry, well, "Whose land is this?" Henry says, "It's my land." And Henry is the 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 man later on in the film. He's the melancholic mm -hmm. Hale. And this is a thing too in the, in the 
in the book that, yeah, William Hale had tried to get him drunk several times and get him to sign away his allotments. Yeah. Even though that was illegal, the only way you could collect allotments was through inheritance, and it was generally through the female line. Um, but... And that's the other aspect that the, why they key in in the investigation on Hale is because Hale had been trying to get that law changed because he thought it was for the betterment of the community. Mm-hmm. But well, there's that thing, you know, it's like, oh, you know, we're going to move to Oklahoma and all the white folks were like. Oh, sure. Go ahead. That's just junk land. Oh, there's oil there. Oh, well, you you can't possibly handle all that wealth yourself. We'll have to come in and help and help yeah. you out, right? Yeah. Teach you and such. I don't, I won't swear on your part. You can do whatever, <laughs> but they, yeah, they attract and it attracts the the worst type of people. Which again, uh, Grand makes a point of pointing out in the in the book that um, that's another part of the reason that the Bureau comes in. Um, it's not highlighted in the film, but that um, Kels, no, what is, Blackie Thompson. Blackie mm. Thompson mm-hmm. in the film, in real life, Blackie Thompson was working for the Bureau as an informant. Oh, that, that, yeah, they don't yeah. say anything so in the film. About they're that. worried, the Bureau, Hoover, is worried about... Um, this coming to light becoming a scandal after the Teapot Dome scandal and everything. He wants to avoid scandals, so he's worried about somebody discovering that Blackie Thompson, a criminal, was working for the Bureau and is out there roaming the, the hills of Oklahoma. So that's part of the reason that they, uh, they send someone in to investigate, these, to see about these murders is because they're trying to drum up a good news story and he's trying to build the reputation Mm. of Mm. the Bureau. And yeah, that's uh, something that's definitely missing from the film is that... Were there no, like, like I'm going to try and think back now and I almost want to see it again because they don't even... Is there anything to tip tip us off? That's So there's a huge spoiler alert. No, there isn't. And it's funny because there is the aspect when we see um, uh, the Bureau gather at night and they're all relaying Mm. the information Mm -hmm. that they Mm -hmm. gathered, which is actually a thing that is in the book, which I was surprised. I thought, oh, this isn't a film contrivance. It's actually something (laughs) that they would meet. They all met out in the field. yeah, Yeah, because some of the agents were out as agents, and then they had uh, um, Tataka Means as the actor's name. What is his character's name? Anyways, the the uh, the First Nations bureau agent who's going around introducing himself, uh, investigating his Osage narrative uh, history. That that was a real person, but so they had people. And then also, I didn't notice that there's a scene where Hale's selling cattle to a guy. Mm-hmm. That guy is another bureau agent. So they have all these bureau agents undercover, so they had to meet at night. That was near the fire, wasn't it? That mm-hmm. was they yes. were they were they on the field, those... they were watching Hale's yes. ranch burn. And or that's something. the yeah. other thing yeah. that there's subtext tying it together is Hale tried to collect his insurance policy on Henry Roan but was denied collecting the insurance policy. Um, so instead, he tries to collect his insurance policy by having his man, his yeah. man set, his set his land on mm-hmm. fire. After mm-hmm. increasing his policy. Yes. Right? Yes. And I think the, and the insurance agent was working with the Bureau. Yes, the yeah. Bureau insurance. Yeah, because yeah. you've got some work to do in the yeah. morning is what they say. Yeah. Well, a piece of work. <laughs> yeah. It's just, and yeah, William Hale, I mean, you watched, there's some aspects of that documentary, but I'm guessing you, you watched it. Yeah, he was a cowboy from Texas mm-hmm. who just came up here and um, yeah, he amassed the, uh, in the book they talk about how he sort of amassed this, uh, this wealth from, from hard work, but from just living in a tent, not spending all his money, scrouging everything, saving, yeah. and then try making these friendships that were 
advantageous to him. The other thing that they don't highlight, they hint at a little bit in the book. Um, there's a part where Ernest is in the pool hall and he's talking to Hale about the murder of Anna and it's hinted at a little bit. He says something and uh, Hale says, Byron. And then, he, and then he asks if it's him. Uh, oh, about the pregnancy. It is generally believed that William Hale was the father of Anna Brown's baby. Oh, that's interesting. So he had his own child executed. Hmm. Yeah, so, so, so at the beginning when you mentioned the devil. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there you have it. Yeah, and there's just so many things like, um, I don't wonder how much is it like Scorsese putting in there, like when Ernest turns again and says that he's going to testify after the death of uh, his child, um, Hale tells him, they'll forget, nobody's gonna remember. This will just be another thing that happened, and no, they'll forget about it. People will forget about it. <clears throat> he was right. And he unfortunately, was right. he was. Mm -hmm. And, and you was, know, and it, you know that Hitler said once that they're like, well, what about the Armenians, right? Because when he when they were going to the final solution, mm -hmm. he's and somebody said, well, what about the Armenians? And that was the Turkish the Turkish massacre of the Armenians and Hitler said who remembers the Armenians nobody remembers the Armenians right so there and then that goes into the whole book banning thing like mm -hmm. how are we supposed to prevent these things from happening in the future if we aren't teaching them now now yeah right yeah Anyways, I hate to be a bummer on this. <laughs> no, I mean this is <laughs> it's kind a, of a, yeah. it all a little is, bit of it? a bummer. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a hard um it's a tough story to as, as and, and I'll be honest as a, as a as a white person, it was a tough story to stomach to, to watch. Yeah. Right? yeah to, and you know. And although I don't feel culpable culpable, mm -hmm. I do feel a certain I, I feel some a certain I don't even know what to call it responsibility I feel a re responsibility not that I am responsible for what happened but I'm 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 I feel a, I feel even more an urgent responsibility to or there's a sense of urgency to make sure that these things don't happen again in the future right that's my responsibility right to acknowledge it and to say and there's lots of things we can't even talk about here because we're just not yeah right mm -hmm. we're just we can't we're it. three white yeah. guys like yeah, you yeah. Said, right? i think there yeah. yeah there was when we talked about doing this there was i think we all had the same feeling yeah. about oh we can't we can't speak we, sh we can shouldn't. talk about things yeah. but it's yeah. not ours to Space. say yeah. certain aspects or to give our point of view on things that aren't our point of view right, right? right. but <clears throat> i think at the same time that's yeah part of the reason that i did want to do it is because the aspect of the film, what Scorsese, the angle that Scorsese is coming from, and that he's telling the story for the importance of the story. And that's, yeah, so to, to speak up, sort of, to not be culpable and just saying, well, oh, no, that's, that doesn't involve me, so I, I don't have to say anything about it because... Yeah, well, right. that's not so you know, long that ago. happened so long ago. Right. It's not my deal. It yeah. happened over there. It's it's that it's done. Like whatever. Yeah. Yeah. What's, no, that's what's not talking my... about it going to do. Yes, right, right. And that's yeah. another way that these things continue to happen is by the people that are in our position. Yeah, just it's easier to pretend that. Well, you know, just to like yeah, just like. Um, um, banning the books right if we, if yeah, we don't look at that, it yeah. if we don't look at it then it it didn't happen yeah, yeah. and yeah. if we say you can't read it then yeah tough luck. or critical what is it critical race theory mm -hmm. in yeah. this state whatever the, i don't know what the, just teach the history right right just teach it as it was teach don't, it honestly yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> and 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 own it right but anyways
Yeah, because you're not your history. No. But you could become your history if you don't learn it. The right. there was who was it the the and I think I mentioned this in in when we were talking about all the president's men. It's like there was a there was a a, a minister or a priest in Germany in the 20s and 30s and 40s and he said he said oh you know they started uh, they started taking those people away but that's okay that i wasn't a yes. communist mm. yeah. right i wasn't a communist oh then they then they got started getting rid of the gay people and the mentally ill but that's okay because i i wasn't one of them and then they started taking away the jews and i'm like well okay but i'm still not one of them but then there was nobody left to speak for me when they came for me right yeah yeah anyways yeah no i, I mean it's um i mean it might be getting out there a little bit but the other day the um, rachel maddow was on mm -hmm. seth meyer's late night talk show and she was kind of talking about how um how these things that the um, the the divide that can be used um for um political gain mm -hmm. right by having people say you know it's not my and then, and then it's not my yeah my area to speak and then sort of uh building up the whatever the other group is as an other the others yeah the vermin <laughs> them and sort of putting that well they're we could have a society, we could have a democracy if it, if it wasn't for these people, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Which we've talked about, I, th I believe, a little bit on, I don't know if we talked about it on this podcast, but she's saying that that's, that's the whole game, right? To, to paint another group as distrustful, to, they're the problem. Oh, if you're not with us, you're against us. Yes, mm. to gain yeah. your base, and it's just... Yep. It's all in service of the next thing. Yeah. Right? You're always trying to do what what's best for you. Yes. Right? And yeah, and to speak about where we sort of started is that so I rewatched a, a number of Scorsese films, surprise. Um <laughs> but that's the that's the common the I mean there's several common things. Most of them is these um not always dumb, but sometimes like <laughs> Ernest, the dumb mm -hmm. white men who have um, sort of troubled views on the world or are only invested in their own self-interest and slowly sort of, you know, compromise after compromise after compromise until they're usually in the film deeper and deeper into a situation Oh, and Henry Hill. Henry, Henry Hill. And it, usually these yeah. guys, even at the end of the film, uh, there's no remorse. Like Henry Hill or um, uh, what is his name? Jacob? Is that his name? Wolf of Wall Street. Jordan. Jordan Belfort. Belfort. Mm -hmm. yeah. These are two guys that because of the system, because of their position, they get out at the other side and can brag about these mm -hmm. things that they did without consequences by and large in Scorsese's films there's not they don't suffer a lot of consequences but I think this one's different because at least he's showing the victims more a lot of those films you don't spend any time on the victims no no hardly at all no yeah and there's the Scorsese aspects you always have to have a voiceover a little bit, <laughs> which we have a little bit of this. We don't have the freeze frame thing, though. No. Um, no. And then there's the tracking shots. I, you know, I, I find that because I, I'm doing more videos, I, 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 I really notice technical stuff. Like I notice the color grading of the movie and how it fit with the whole with the scenery yeah it was very brown like it was lots of browns and 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 we talked about the makeup yeah we talked about Ernest teeth mm -hmm. yes right away yes. there was teeth in his clothes right and yes and it, and those things set the and and yeah and like you said the opening shot yeah 
There's the, rewatching it last night. There's the scene um, where um, Molly's. They describe in the book a little bit. Molly's having a, a a tea party or a party. She's having a gathering, and it's when when Anna shows up drunk. Uh, but there's the shot that goes. It's it goes through the house and it goes back to the back room and it's Lizzie the mother mm-hmm. like laying down on the couch or whatever. And there's there's like a mirror behind her and the way we come into the room and then look at Lizzie. I was like, oh man, that was very like they had to coordinate how that happens. So you don't see anything in the mirror because this is one big long shot mm-hmm. going through the mm-hmm. house and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's the scene. Uh, we had it happen in our screening. And then uh, last night, because that's where uh, the owl shows up for the first time. Yeah. And then it shows up again in the second time. When it showed up in the second time last night, the, the old couple that was sitting behind me. Mm-hmm. The owl shows up. I heard the woman go, oh, no. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, because we talked about that. Now, like, I'm not I'm not an expert, but they're in indigenous culture, the owl sometimes is a, is a symbol of foreboding, right? And so when that, when that owl came in, mm-hmm. I was like, oh. Yeah, Michael some, knew. I, was yeah. Like, oh, the first yeah. <laughs> I mean, they kind of present yeah. it to you in that way, too. Yes. It, before even it's explained in the movie, the way it's shot, you're like, okay. Or like, a, I, whenever I see here. a bird too, because a bird, in right. mo- or a bird, like a bird coming into a house is a sign of death. Yeah. Right? So whenever I see that in a movie, I'm like, hmm. oh, something's, okay. yeah. uh, something's coming. Something's up. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I liked it. I would probably, I don't know if I would see it again. I'm not one for watching <laughs> movies twice. Certain movies I will. Okay. But, uh, but uh, now that we've talked about it, though, I might. Yeah, I'd like to go, go back, back, I think. Evaluate. I won't. Uh, I'll watch it at home, put my own intermission in so I don't get uh, <laughs> sued by Apple. Um, but yeah, no, it's one of those ones that I think if it's still playing in the theater, you've got to go see it on the big screen. Oh, I for sure. Yeah. I would recommend it to anybody. And I mean, even now, mm-hmm. like historically, it. I I would say it's pretty pretty accurate Mm -hmm. i think scorsese oh he may not be a stickler for that but he's pretty good with those sorts of things it was important on this one i think for him to to be accurate because they use as accurate Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. osage in every aspect like he used osage in the costuming behind the camera there's osage extras um, the, the beginning of the film, uh, with the, um, with the pipe man that mm-hmm. they're burying and there's the children looking yeah. in. Um, so that whole section is taken from, uh, a different book, hmm. um, a pipe for February, which, um, the author of that book, um, what was his name? Uh, Ch- Charles, Charles uh, Redcorn was the Osage that wrote that book, and that one is fictional, but it's based in this timeline on real events, and it's it is the Osage point of view. So when David Grant was doing research for his book, he met with Charles Redcorn, and he read a pipe for February. And Scorsese read a pipe for February. What uh, is the what is the it. Do, have you found out what the significance of bearing the pipe is? Like, no, I don't know I, what that. I maybe I'll take a look. I've and, been going down uh, like after I watched it last night. I was like, oh yeah, I was gonna look up the meaning of this and this and the, the apples on the the grave mm-hmm. or the caskets and everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of that may be uh, gifts to the grandmothers. So when we would go to, and I'm like, once again, I'm not right. I'm not a culture cultural expert here we would when we would go to when we would go to a sweat we would bring a gift and and a lot of times it was fruit yeah i'm not so sure i but don't know if that's because they couldn't get a lot of fruit there yeah because i know i think in the book gran mentions that they would pack the the casket with food for the journey to mm, the afterlife okay. type yeah, thing yeah. um 
but uh, where was it? oh yeah so anyways uh, so this book is the basis for the whole or taken from that part taken from the book and uh, when they were at Khan uh, Lily Gladstone and Scorsese said that they're trying to get the book adapted mm. into something they have this have the Osage even more of a part of it to tell mm-hmm. that story so this Scorsese said this isn't the end right mm-hmm. but um anyways uh Charles Redcorn his son Yancey Redcorn is an actor he's in the film uh he plays uh Chief Bonacastle. So he is the one uh, when they decide to send uh, the guy to Washington or wherever to investigate. He's the one who's usually speaking in those scenes, and he's the one that goes on the, to discuss. We came here. They t- we came here because the white man mm-hmm, taking mm-hmm, from mm-hmm. us our kids. So uh, that's Yancey Redcorn. And that was he, an intense scene. I, well, like when I watched that scene, I was like, I was like, he's he. I don't know. I don't even believe there was a lot of acting going on. He mm-hmm. was just saying it like this is the facts right here. This is what I'm saying. I'm not an actor. I'm a member of this this these, these people, and I'm telling you, this is what effing happened. So. <laughs> Scorsese yeah. is a big fan of improvisation. And I wondered about that. Mm. And uh, the, the story that Yancey and De Niro tell is that Yancey was on set kind of just saying that stuff as they're in between shots getting ready. And De Niro overheard him and went to Scorsese and was like, you hear this guy? You've got to put him in on screen. You've got to get him. So, uh, yeah, so in that scene... Scorsese, he says, Scorsese just told him, scat, just scat, just say whatever, say, say mm-hmm. what you were saying. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Yancey says huh. that he's, and he didn't, because he's sitting there with De Niro and Gladstone and DiCaprio, he says, after the scene, he's like, I don't even know what I said, <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> but yeah, he yeah. was trying to imagine what his great grandfather, who was alive during this time, who was poisoned and murdered, mm-hmm. what his great grandfather would say. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Okay. When uh, uh, Molly had, so Molly's diabetes. Yes. And she was getting the new medication. Yes, from Toronto. From Mm -hmm. Toronto, yeah. (laughs) Did, um, do you think, do you think uh, he knew Edwin? um, um, Ernest. Ernest, yeah. Knew that he was poisoning her? I, I don't know. I wonder about that. Do you so, think he maybe had an idea, but he just... Uh, maybe he what? wasn't like, sure, but I think there yeah. had to be something there. Yeah, like, think they, so? I yeah. think that there was enough said that... Cause I my mean, he was kind of dumb, like, but yeah, it was there, right? Like, yeah, it's like, how do you not know, buddy? You're, yeah. She's not getting better, man. Right, like, she's getting worse. Yeah. 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 I, well, do you want to approach... Let's. Do you want to go from the book first or the film first? <laughs> Either one. So in the book... Um, it's stated that uh, that it's the doctors. There's never any mention of Ernest administrating hmm. the the um, insulin to Molly. That mm-hmm. it's it's the doctors, it's the the Sean or Sean brothers, mostly who he makes a big huge case throughout the book that they are not to be trusted. Mm-hmm. We can get back to them, but. Um, so yeah, I think that's a contrivance for the film, but there's the aspect of that that I was keying in on watching it again is the scene where he puts it in his own drink. And the first time I wasn't sure exactly why he was doing that, right? Cuz he had seems to have sort of a a conflict of conscience and this is around the time when Hale comes to him and is like, you got to sign this, right? Because, and he, I think he's realizing that Hale is just out to have all of them gone so Mm -hmm. he can get the money. Yeah. Because I I think up to that point. Just in case something happens to you. (laughs) I think up to that point. Nothing will. (laughs) He's going along with it. I, I don't know, but my reading is he's going along with it that his children are going to get all of this money, right? Yeah. And anyways, but rewatching that part where he 
puts it in his own drink and he drinks it. I was wondering, I wonder if he's trying to go for like a murder suicide thing. Mm. Like she's going to go, I'm going to go too. Or was he curious of whether or not what, what, it, what, was, what it was doing? What, what it was doing? Because yeah. uh, uh, like you said, he, he he wasn't the brightest. You know, he wasn't the brightest. He was just a tragic figure. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you have to have some sort of conscience. I mean, you look back at a lot of these characters in Scorsese films, and I've mentioned Henry Hill a lot, right? Yeah. And Goodfellas. Um, Starts off as, you know, it's all exciting and all fun. And then and then people are getting killed. And then you're killing people. And then you're, you know, and then he's like, then and he's a cocaine addict. And he's seeing like, like choppers in the sky. And, you know, he's getting paranoid. But then he flips, right? Finally, yeah. He flips. So you have to know, like, like he had to have some idea of what was going on. And I think in the end, as sad it is, is I don't. Maybe he didn't have a full, I don't think he, he had a full change of heart. He was probably saving his own skin on that one, right? Yeah, I don't so. know. But yeah, the, the doctors, because oh, those, um, those there's, two. There's, yeah. there's two scenes that they don't quite explain in the book, or they, there's, it's not like in your face explained. The one is just the uh, Anna's body looking for the bullet. It's in Grand's book. He makes oh, it yeah, up. Yeah, that it's right. generally oh, okay, believed I remember that one. Yeah, that the Schoen brothers that they they removed the bullet from her brain to hide the caliber of bullet, so that it wouldn't be connected. Um. See, and that, I couldn't figure that out until you just, now you said it. I'm like, oh, why would they dig around and are trying yes. to find the I bullet? I mean, they right? said they're trying to find the bullet, but yeah. And and um, in the book, uh, Grant talks about that, uh, that they go back and they exhume Anna's body with William Hale. And I think um, the district attorney and the sheriff or somebody, but the district attorney, by the way, for context is someone that William Hale helped get elected. Hmm. Um, but they exhume the corpse looking for, again, they decide to go back and because Hale is behind this investigation Right, and in the book, Grant talks about how Hale was um, right. He makes himself as the media. You have any information, come to me. But you come to me, and you've got information that I know is correct. I'll ignore it. And that he was putting out false rumors about other people to mislead, because there was lots of investigators going around trying to solve this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but they end up. Um, taking Anna's skull, basically, and they say in the scene later when the uh, bureau agent is talking to them that, oh, yeah, I got the skull. But they, yeah, they take her skull and they keep it. And um, this, the, uh, the house um, that um, her sister's in, I lost the name again, unfortunately. Anna? No. No. Um, that explodes. Uh, Rita, Rita and Bill's house. Mm-hmm. They say in the scene too, but the that was one of the doctor's houses that they sold to uh, to Rita and Bill because Rita and Bill move further into town, and then Ernest and Molly move to be close to them, and they're all trying to be close to the, in together and in town away mm-hmm. from. Uh, so they, they sell the house to them. There's a scene, though, in the movie um, where um, Hale's wife calls up the doctor, and he says, if, she says, if you have anything important in the house, you best be removing it now. And I was like, oh, because that's his house, right? That's oh, all his oh, furniture, okay. all his all stuff. Right, She's right, telling yeah, yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. We don't see much of... His wife, wife no. at all. There, I don't believe there. She's any in any scenes she's, at all. She's in a few scenes, but she doesn't. 
speak a lot because there's the dinner table scene where uh, Molly says that she's pregnant. Oh right, right. right. And they oh go yeah, over okay, and congratulate now, yeah, her yeah. there. And then, is that her daughter? Is that their that's daughter? their daughter? Yeah. Okay. And you know, it, it it reminds me of just like a mob family, right? <laughs> like like the wives of you know of the Godfather or the or the whatever the mobster. It's like it's like how do you not? How do you not know your husband's in the mob? Like, how do you not yeah. know? How do you know? So, why is there any culpability there for the? Probably, for I the mean, life? there's the scene too that she's actually now thinking about that she's in, where there's that because there. I said this to you after we watched the film that there's a couple of shots where I was just like, just the image when it's immediately on the screen. I was like, oh, that's like it. Like I think I said described it as like a punch or something. Mm-hmm. But there's the scene where. Uh, they bring Ernest to Hale's house and everybody's standing there like in the dark and everything. And it's the oil barons and that's the lawyer Mm -hmm. and it's Hale's family. She's in that scene too. And she's telling him, you don't want to see your uncle die in prison, do you? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, The other scene that she's in. Okay. Now I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was something else in there I was going to go with, but <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah, so there's, I don't know uh, about you, Andrew, but yeah, there's there's that scene. There's uh, the, especially the second appearance of the owl mm-hmm. and just the way that's shot. Mm-hmm. And then there's the, the Scorsese almost thing of the early on when Molly is voiceover telling us about each individual person and their death and we're seeing them lying on their bed and stuff and it's the shot one after the other oh yeah yeah and the or, one yeah, that the that, scene that where he's really, shot in the back yeah the, in the, at the oil on the oil fields and is that the scene you're talking yeah about? i think so there's the yeah. one that that ends it that really got me was when the woman is at the house and she comes down right. the stairs and you see the guy with the gun in the window and she puts the baby in the carriage and then That's he it. shoots her and just comes out and collects the child. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Just yeah. cold blooded. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's the, the, it's just sort of the way, because normally Scorsese, if we're talking about Goodfellas or Casino, everything, it's, it's this stylized, right? Mm-hmm. Hyper stylized. And it's not in this. This is, this is stark. Yeah. This is real. This is real. This is well, and I think that's. I think that was. I mean, Goodfellas, although historically, it happened. Those things happened. Those people, like like uh, Nicky Santoro and 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 those people in Casino and Goodfellas and and. Uh, but the there's somehow. There's somehow it's just a story where this is like more, this is almost more urgent. It's right. more like, like, th- like you need to see this. You need to, you need to understand the brutality behind this. The mob, everybody knows that the mob did this and the mob did that. Yada, yada, yada. Right. This is, this is our, you need to know now you need. And I think maybe he just wants to smack you in the mm-hmm. head and say, Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Pay attention. Yeah, yeah, pay, yeah. you're right. Yeah, yeah, pay attention. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because we've seen with all of these films, Scorsese has a bag of tricks, what he can do. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I think it's a similar uh, thing to what he was doing in The Irishman, right? Like he's, he, The Irishman to a degree is also, like it ends with De Niro alone in this retirement home and his daughter his like nobody is mm-hmm. there to see mm-hmm. him in it, right yeah. so it's it, and normally that's not the way we see a Scorsese movie end right like I said normally you the guy gets out the other side and it's if it's Jordan Belfort he's a public speaker right. and he's still going still on no harm no foul no, no harm right? yeah, yeah. He's, yeah he's suffered no consequences yeah and then in the Irishman, at, at least um, the consequences is that he's got nobody, right? Mm-hmm. It's and f- maybe um, 
as far as like the law goes or anything like that it's maybe not just but it's a consequence that is a consequence for that character right yeah yeah you put him in jail what's that gonna do but you're not gonna alienate, rehabilitate him yeah he mm-hmm. alienated from his family is possibly worse for him anyway for him yeah, yeah. um yeah, was there anything else we wanted to talk about before we wrap it up? No, I think we I think we touched on I everything. I think we yeah. touched on a lot. More than I thought we would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh I just wanted to end then by pointing out because we're focusing a lot on the events of the film and we mentioned Oklahoma and the book bands and stuff. But we have, um, I mean, there was the the missing indigenous woman that was just found mm-hmm. last week, and we have another one missing, and there's still the, what is it, the 22 calls to action. And so this is, the victims, by and large, in our film are, indigenous women Mm -hmm. and because um they're the bottom rung right they're they're women and they're indigenous the 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 um uh, the target that it's that nobody is paying attention to i guess right the voice is not being heard yeah and um in Canada, we've got our own history of of, uh, of First Nations rights. So uh, I just wrote down a, a couple facts that I want to to say. Sure. So um, so, eighteen seventy one is when the first treaties are signed, enforced treaties. Um, Manitoba becomes a province. And uh, that's as far at that, that point Western expansion had got. So uh, treaties were signed, uh, agreements were made. Um, they do the same thing in, uh, in the US, which is part of the reason that the Osage made the deal that they did in Canada is uh, they said, yeah, okay, we'll buy this land for you and we'll pay you for it. But uh, in both places, they tried to pay with goods instead of money. So in Manitoba, they tried to play with clothing and stuff instead. And there was sort of um, a misunderstanding, if you will, between the tribes that signed. Because, again, going back to the Osage and their understanding of, of property and land, they believed that they were signing an agreement that we will share this land. Yes, you will come in and you will share this with us. Mm-hmm. We won't drive you out. You won't drive us out. Uh, and yeah, that's 1871. So we're a country for four years at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1876 is when uh, the Indian Act becomes a thing where the government decides. Uh, that ultimately they can manage the land and the monies of Indians as long and they have to comply with their conditions despite what was signed in treaties. Um, And in this 1871 treaty, there was an agreement that um, alcohol and other substances could be sold on Indian lands. Indian Act takes away those rights um, prohibiting intoxicants, uh, banning uh, spiritual ceremonies, which is another big thing that uh, I didn't write down, but potlatches and stuff were banned for quite oh, a long time. For a long time. Yeah. Sundance. The, Sundance in the States. Yeah. And potlatches here. Yeah, yeah. and the, the, it obligated... Uh, the children to go to schools, and uh, it made uh, voting rights conditional. Um, then so, it's not a right. Is yes. It? <laughs> so we you, call it a right. <laughs> I think my understanding was it that you could vote if you signed away your treaty rights. 
Uh, and then 1883 is when we establish residential schools, um, which, again, um, a point I wanted to make talking about um, the events of this film and this is, like, uh, a lot of the people that took part in making the film are the grandchildren of the individuals that are the victims of this film. Molly's mm -hmm. uh, granddaughter... Uh, w was a help to David Grant telling his this story, right? So it's it's not that far in history, right? It's mm -hmm. it's a hundred years, but that's not very many generations. This is still like fresh. Same with Tulsa and residential schools, which go up until 1996. So it's not ancient history. It's mm -hmm. something that's it's still, our generation. It's mm -hmm. our generation. Um, 1939 is the su Supreme Court rules that the Indian Act includes Inuit. So all of a sudden, in 1939, um, they are taking over the rights of Inuit people in the Northwest Territories, and none of it. Um, and it's not till 1960, after they had served in both World War I and World War II, uh, that the right to vote is granted. 1960. 1960? 1960. And then lastly is 2019 was the inquiry into the murdered and missing indigenous women. So this is still fresh stuff, unfortunately, relevant to the events of this film. And so I think worth pointing out at least acknowledging yes mm -hmm. acknowledging that these things are happening and have happened and still haven't uh, been uh, there hasn't been a lot of room for for healing I, I suppose in some of these cases um, yeah so I think we'll end there uh, we'll acknowledge that uh, this podcast was recorded on uh, Clay Tanay. That's how you pronounce it, correct? Unceded. Uh, the unceded yeah. territory of the Clayley Tanay. Yeah. In the Arts North podcast studio in Studio 2880. Thank you again, Andrew. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.